Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Stoic Salon podcast, where we talk about life, love, work, play, and a little bit of stoicism. And this is officially the beginning of season two. Last year, if you remembered, I chatted with the speakers, the women speakers who are going to be appearing at the first ever women's conference on stoicism. And so this year, I'm going to do the same. Our conference theme this year is courage. So our theme is Courageous Paths to Flourishing. We're going to explore what the Stoics have to tell us about courage and how we can naturally be more courageous with the Stoic guidance. Brittany and I are, of course, the founders, the organisers and the hosts of Courageous Paths to Flourishing. And we're here just to get the conversation going. Brittany, just give us a brief uh, intro to yourself. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here with you. Such a pleasure chatting with you, Catherine, again. So I am Brittany Polat. I am a member of the Modern Stoicism team, the Stoic Fellowship. And this year I have started, along with Eve Riches and Paul Wilson, a new nonprofit called Stoic Care, where we try to share the social and caring side of Stoicism with the world, specifically with caregivers. So if you're interested in those themes as well, you can check out our website at Stoic Care. But yes, our conference last year was a success. We got a lot of good feedback. So Catherine and I are really happy to be doing it again this year. We are. And everyone, I'm Catherine. I host the Stoic Salon podcast. My little Stoic community is called the Stoic Salon. I started getting seriously interested in Stoicism. Brittany, was it around the same time? When did you get into sort of seriously start studying? I bought my first book in October 2016. 16. I'm thinking yeah. it were about the same. I started, I, I came across the Stoicon and Stoic Week. I think it was 2015. I came to Stoicism because yeah, I've told you this before, just my fear of death led me to Googling how to beat your fear of death. I ended up finding Donald Robertson's course on death and yeah, came to know Stoicon and Stoic Week. But courage, I have never really thought about, never really thought that I was ever going to be a courageous person or make particularly courageous choices in my life. And we're going to talk about the messaging and the signaling of courage as young women and what that that means meant to us growing up. But just to give some background to why courage for this year's conference, I was reading the work of Bronnie Ware, who was a palliative nurse. She's still alive, but I don't think she does nursing anymore. And she wrote that book, The Ten Top Regrets of the Dying or something like that. Has anyone heard it? And uh, one of the top regrets of the dying is about that lack of courage in a lifetime. People said that they wish they had been more courageous in living lives that represented themselves, where they were themselves, living authentic lives, lives with integrity. I thought that was really interesting for me now in this stage of my life. And also I was at the airport late last year and saw Ryan Holiday's book, Courage. Ryan Holiday is writing four books on the Stoic virtues. And I thought that was a sign. (laughs) The word courage is appearing. So I think courage is something that I really want to discuss and hence the conference. And I think as a child, I always thought of myself as quite a scared child, like I was scared of the dark. And so, yeah, I wanted to start, Brittany, by talking about you as a child, and then I'll get back to me as well. And just what did courage appear to you as? What were your first impressions of what being courageous was meant to look like and sound like and be like? Do you have any childhood memories you want to share with us? Yeah, that's taking me way back. When I think of my childhood, I automatically think of Disney movies, I think. (laughs) So I grew up in a time when Disney was putting out all the princess movies with the Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, those kinds of things. So I guess just drawing from popular culture, those meant a lot to me. So I guess I always imbibed the idea that women could be courageous and should be courageous. As a girl, I felt I was always encouraged to go for my dreams. Nothing can hold you back. You can do whatever you want. Be an astronaut, be a scientist, cure cancer, this kind of thing. So like you said, messaging, right? In the culture that I grew up in, and obviously it's not the same for everyone, different times and places 
have different messaging and women have to face a completely different environment to express themselves and to express courage. But the particular time when I grew up, it was always this encouragement to go get them. But looking back, I can see that didn't necessarily prepare me for my life and what I actually needed to do in my life. And the types of courage that I feel that I've needed are completely different to what was presented in those images. Obviously, okay, Disney movies, sanitized, stereotypes, yes. It can still be very influential. And of course, pop culture is, still has a huge influence on children growing up, on teenagers, and even on adults. The culture that surrounds us is what we think we ought to do in a lot of cases. So it's really important to analyze where our ideas on courage come from. Do you have mm. any similar stories or was yours totally different? I think superheroes and superheroines were certainly part of my cultural upbringing. I remember Wonder Woman, she was just amazing. And the thing is with superheroes is they always had a, a sort of a power, a superpower. And it seemed as if, which I didn't realise as a young child, but thinking about it today, that the superhero would never fail. If they showed up and stepped into the arena, so to speak, they would win. So good would win over evil because they were endowed with that superheroic power. And I was thinking about Hercules and Hercules is a ancient figure who was, who the Stoics actually brought bring up a lot in conversations that they had or have been written down. And Epictetus talk, was it Epictetus that talks about Hercules? So Hercules was able to perform absolute feats. And I feel that he was just endowed with those powers. So he would never fail so long as he stepped out into the world and performed the difficult tasks. And in Epictetus, it's Epictetus, and I'm actually reading from Donald Robertson's How to Think Like a Roman Emperor. He actually refers to Hercules. And the idea is that, yeah, you need to step out into the difficult situations in order to be courageous. So Epictetus is saying, what do you think Hercules would have amounted to if there had not been monsters such as the Nemean lion, the Hydra, the stag of Artemis, etc., etc.? So it's almost as if, if Hercules had not showed up he would never have been Hercules. So the, so, so the superhero needs challenges, but at the same time, he's always going to meet them. Yeah. And I think the superhero meets the challenges because they are suited to what is within their means, so with their powers. Mm -hmm. So Wonder Woman could only win certain powers because she had those, I don't know, that jewellery around her wrist <laughs> or whatever it was. And Superman had other powers. So I think there's... Hercules would have had to really have an understanding of what he was meant to do in the world and what fights he had to fight. Of course, the script was pre-written, like the Stoics do say that the script for us is pre-written. We have a, we're characters in this play of life and we're written into the world to do certain things. So everyone's version of courage is different. And I think that's what interests me is that we grow up feeling that we have to perform at a certain level or do these risky things and go and fight fights and do all this in order to be courageous. But it's not a one size fits all courage. Courage depends on what is within your means. So for Hercules, it meant going and fighting lions and all these crazy beasts because he was actually built for that. That's the role he was born to play but if I go out and fight a lion there's no way that I would win that fight firstly secondly it wouldn't even be a courageous move on my behalf it would be <laughs> unwise because I'm not built for that and I think I've just brought up something that I want to talk about later with you that to be courageous you need to be wise and prudent you need to have all the virtues but I'll leave that conversation for a bit later but anything else superhero-wise that strikes you as interesting in terms of growing up and the expectation growing up? So you're, say, a mother, I don't know if you want to jump that far ahead now, to motherhood where women are told to be superheroes, superwomen, to have the family, right. to have the career, to have the whatever it is. Any comments? On that? And if I've taken us too far into the future, bring us back if you like. No, that's all really valuable. I do want to touch on motherhood and superhero, but I'd also like to go back to what you said about certainty 
and contrast that with the uncertainty that I think a lot of us feel in these times. I think certainty, knowing your knowing your mission in the world gives you courage a lot of times. And so many of us are lacking in that today. We don't have a preformed identity that's mm -hmm. that we can just grow into. It's on our shoulders to make something of ourselves. We create our social identities. Sometimes it feels so performative, but it's something that we're constantly having to do for ourselves. And we don't have that certainty of Hercules that, oh, I'm meant to go out and slay the lion. And I think courage is also facing those uncertainties, not just social uncertainties, obviously, but uncertainty of the future. None of us know what's going to happen tomorrow. There's a lot of anxiety and social pressure facing all of us today in ways that didn't exist to the same extent in the past. But in the past, you read Seneca's accounts of ancient Rome and that they did have a lot of similar problems with social pressures, but I think it's just excruciating today, mm. obviously because of our interconnectedness with mm. the internet and social media, the rapid news cycle, all of these things. So I think it takes courage to, to face all this uncertainty, social and just not knowing what's going to happen. Mm. Going back to what you brought up about some of the choices that women in particular face, of course, men face them as well. Everyone faces choices about their family life, their career, what you want to make of yourself. But I do think a lot of people expect us to be superheroes in doing it all. And that's certainly a choice I faced in my past that actually led me to find stoicism. Mm -hmm. So I was pursuing an academic career for a while and I loved it. It was wonderful. It was fun. It was exciting. It was stimulating, rewarding, everything I could ask for. But when I had my first child, I realized there was a major clash here <laughs> between what I wanted to do with the career and what I wanted to do as a mother. I felt like I was serving two masters, basically. You need to be there at all times for your career and you need to be there at all times for your child. And it just, it didn't work for me. That's not to say that it doesn't work for everyone. I think as you were alluding to earlier, it takes wisdom to know, hey, for me, my situation, my particular talents, my disposition, the things that are available to me, this is what's right for me to do. It's not necessarily going to be the right thing for other people. In fact, for another person, it might be the wrong thing to do. But just bringing in that understanding of the whole situation, knowing yourself and knowing what your talents are and the best thing for you, as well as your particular family, it takes so much wisdom. It takes a lot of judgment, hopefully good judgment. And in my case, it took a lot of courage because I was going against the grain of received expectations in the environment that I was in. Mm. I was I didn't even know anyone else who had kids. <laughs> no one else in my department was having kids at that time. So it was very against the grain. And speaking as someone who likes to please other people, I'm sure maybe you can relate. I'm sure a lot of our audience can relate as well. It's so hard to do something that you know someone that you like is going to disapprove of. It's so hard. So mm -hmm. for me, I think that's what took the most courage. It wasn't necessarily something flashy or showy, jumping in front of the enemy, slaying a lion. It was facing that disapproval. And psychological studies have equated the brain's response to social disapproval and social exclusion. It processes it in a very similar way to physical pain. It is actually painful. So stoicism helped me to stay strong and work through that that feeling, oh, have I made the wrong choice? Who am I now? I felt completely obliterated as a person. My, my entire career was gone. So stoicism helped me to see courage in a new light. And I think that's one of the big messages of the Stoics is it doesn't have to be flashy or showy. You just have to do what's right. That is showing courage. Even mm -hmm. if you never get any recognition for it, it's courage. You've brought up so much there. You just mentioned doesn't have to be showy. I think you had a quote to share. Did you have, you made some notes. You were going to talk about had something about glory. Yes, this is from Cicero, Tusculan Disputations 3.3. 3. Yeah. And Cicero is explaining how people get confused between what's really honorable and what's just false appearances of glory. 
So he says, we think the meaning of nature best understood by those who have made up their minds that public office, military commands, and the glory of popularity. So people still pursue these things today, right? Maybe not necessarily the military commands so much, but that popular approval. People think that these are the best and most honorable goals a person can have. These things attract the noblest among us, so the people who are the most talented, even as they pursue that genuine distinction, which is the one chief aim of their nature, they spend their lives in great emptiness, chasing not a solid figure of virtue, but only a shadow shape of glory. Mm-hmm. And to me, it's, it expresses what's still happening, that you go for that, you go for that recognition, you go for the promotion, and then you find that it's a shadow shape, right? It's not really meaningful. The meat isn't there. So things like this have really helped me come to terms with not having the career that I once thought I would have and instead devoting myself to things that for me do make for a meaningful life. Mm. Thanks for that. And thanks for sharing that story because that definitely would resonate with so many of us. There are a couple of things there that we could probably touch upon. One is because you also brought in wisdom again. So wisdom is one of the four virtues. And I want to read something in a bit about how all the four virtues play an equal role in in being courageous. But also, I want to just a quick question and then maybe touch upon uh, role ethics, because I think your decision to decide whether you're going to be the academic or the mother or both or some sort of hybrid scenario has to do with this introspection in order to work out who it is you are. And so the Stoics don't have anything prescriptive to say to us. We have to really work it out. So a lot of it's really hard to work out what it is you're supposed to be in order to then work out how am I supposed to act and in my case, what's courageous and what's wise because it's there's no one size fits all. So in Epictetus, and if you happen to be listening to the podcast or if you're in the room right now, if you just Google role ethics and Epictetus, you come across a Massimo Pigliucci article who refers to the Brian Johnson book and thesis that developed this theory that Epictetus writes in discourses, but it's not very, again, it's not prescriptive at all. But what Epictetus does suggest is that we each have roles to play. And there are some default roles that we're born into. So being a human being is a role that we all just play by default because we are human beings and therefore we're social creatures. So we live in societies and we perform that role. But there are other roles that we might choose, for example, some work roles. So being the academic might be one that you might choose. Being a mother is a role that you chose at one point. So trying to work out which role to take, to commit to, how did you know? What did you do in order to, because and then that leads to, once you know the role that you need to play, that leads to an informed decision about whether your decision to leave academia is courageous or not, right? So the first step is to work out, well, what is within my means? What role have I been given by default or what role have I chosen? How did you know? For me, it wasn't a single moment. It was a progression of, oh, okay, today I'm going to prioritize you know, the baby. Oh, today we're going to prioritize my husband's career because I've got to do this. So it was a slow progression. It wasn't like one eureka moment. But the one thing that I always kept in my mind, which I think is good stoic advice, although I wasn't aware of stoicism at the time, is in my mind, I always ask myself, when I'm 80 years old, looking back, am I ever going to regret spending time with my child? And the answer was always no, I will never, ever regret that. Would I regret maybe leaving my child here while I do something else? I might regret that. So for me, that was always a guiding decision. And I think Tim LeBon says something very similar when he he does the Stoic values clarification, which I also highly recommend. There are some articles on the Modern Stoicism website in the archives you can search for values clarification. And it really helps you to think through, in addition to the role ethics, what's important to me, what's important to me now, what's important to my life as a whole, what's going to be important to me in 30 years, 50 years, who knows? So I think just taking that big picture perspective, instead of getting stuck in the moment, and this is what stoicism is always asking us to do. It's asking us to to broaden our perspective, whether we take the perspective of someone else when we're angry, maybe we switch perspectives and see how it looks from the other person's point of view. 
or as Marcus Aurelius asks us to zoom out and look at all of history as a whole, look at the globe, Mm -hmm. all those people fighting over there, they're the size of ants. This is not important in the grand scheme of things. So I think stoicism is really an exercise in perspective taking and changing the way that you see things. Did you know that what you were, so that was, yeah, a kind of a slow evolution into the role that felt right to you. And you called it courageous though, stepping back from academia. Did you know at the time, was courage even a part of the narrative for you at the time? Did you know? And how do you recognize it now as courage? No, it was an intuition, but it was an extremely difficult one. To an extent, I've always been someone who was ready to do what I thought was right instead of what other people thought was right for me. I had done that several times in the past. So maybe in a way I had been prepared for that, but I definitely didn't think of it as courageous at the time. And that's actually something I'd like to bring out more in our conference as a whole Mm. and in all of our work on courage for past to flourishing is that a lot of the things, I think we tend to devalue ourselves in terms of courage. I'm sure you looking back on your life now, you can say, hey, I left Sydney on a one-way ticket to Athens. That was pretty courageous. I think we don't give ourselves enough credit for actually taking taking those leaps or not taking the leaps as the case may be mm-hmm. standing still when everyone else is moving, that can be an act of courage too. Mm-hmm. But I really want to broaden the, the definition of courage that we apply to ourselves and to other people as well. When we're looking at role models, when we're trying to support our friends or family members, I think we need to identify courageous acts more frequently And by broadening the definition, we can really pull those out. It's not just jumping in front of a train to save a stranger, right? Although obviously that is a courageous act. That is one type of courage, but it's not the only type. The Stoics say that courage is standing firm. I think it's Stobaeus who says Mm. uh, courage is instances of standing firm. If you think about what standing firm actually means, Sometimes it is standing firm in the face of the enemy onslaught coming towards you. Obviously, that's part of it. But it also means standing firm when you think you're doing the right thing and nobody else agrees with you, facing that social disapproval. It also means standing firm when you have to do the hard work, you have to put in the long slog towards your goals. That is also an instance of standing firm. And the Stoics actually used the word endurance. to define courage. Courage is also endurance and hard work. So there are these multiple facets of courage. And I think, I think we need to give ourselves more credit for sure. Absolutely. I think that you mentioned my trip to Athens as courageous. And I think that when we do these acts, they seem courageous and risk risks, but reading more about uh, stoicism I feel that maybe it wasn't a courageous act yeah I just really want to interrogate what we mean by courageous like I, I decided years ago to quit a job my teaching job in Sydney and to buy one way ticket to Athens I wanted to see the world and um, which is very Hollywood courage right it's like you do this big like the Hollywood protagonist is faced with a choice and they take the choice that is a choice full of action so that the narrative, so that something can happen. But the stoic choice would not make a Hollywood movie. (laughs) Because as you said, standing firm, you're just going to have this protagonist that's enduring over the course of a two-hour movie and it's not, nothing's going to really happen. So I'd like to interrogate my choice of not just going to, and then I've got another example, actually, which I feel in retrospect was a courageous act. And it wasn't a single act. It was an enduring, an act of endurance. And that was more courageous, even though at the time I thought I was just being just a weakling and not making a decision. I think we can move ahead a bit, but let's go back if I've missed anything or I've jumped ahead. But there's something that I want to read. Firstly, that all the virtues, courage, wisdom, justice, fairness, and temperance, prudence, moderation, self-moderation, self-control. That's a hard one to translate. Uh, That each of those virtues are inextricably linked. So you can't be courageous if you're not being wise. 
and yeah, and you can't be courageous if you're not also acting prudently in a self-controlled manner. So my heroic trip to Athens, like on a one-way trip, I don't know if that was very prudent at the time because I sold my car, sold everything, went to Athens and didn't really have a plan B. It was great. It was just transformative and all that, but maybe not in the Stoic sense, courageous. This is Diogenes Laertes, and he wrote that each of the virtues is demarcated by a particular sphere of relevance. So courage relates to endurance, like you said. So courage is just that state of mind that says, okay, I can endure this, I ought to endure this, or actually this is not worth enduring. I'm going to step back from it, which is interesting because it's a state of mind. I thought courage was always this act, like the jumping in front of a train that you said. I thought the act of jumping in a train was courageous, but actually it's almost a decision beforehand, right, where you think, okay, can I endure? Right. In stoicism, so, it's all about internal states of mind, though, right? Yeah. So it's really interesting to me that you're saying your act of traveling across the world wasn't courageous because I guess only you can say that because only you actually know the state of your mind, your motivations. Yeah. So that's really interesting. I respect your judgment, although. Prove me wrong. I know for a fact that I was not, this was, I was 20, or well, actually, I was old enough to know better. I was 27. <laughs> But I do not feel that I was exhibiting wisdom. Like I hadn't really thought it through beyond, hey, I want to drop everything and go to Athens. I don't know that I considered prudence. So prudence in terms of what's the best way to do this or should I do this or should I not do this? It was like, nah, I've got to go. So I think that's really interesting. Courage is about, yeah, concerning the mental decision about whether something ought to be tolerated or endured or not. And prudence is concerned with what is to be done or what is not to be done. So the action, so prudence determines the action that you're going to take and courage determines the state of mind that you're in. And you can't be courageous or prudent unless you're wise. And you can't be wise unless, says Cicero, Let's go to Cicero in book three, part two. He talks about wisdom and says that you can't be wise if you're in distress. And so by distress, he means anxious or worried or if you have a turbulent mind. So if you're certainly angry, etc. but any mind that is turbulent, anxious, cannot be wise. Therefore, any decision made under those conditions is not courageous or prudent. Do you want to say that's anything? A, that's a very high bar, isn't it? Yeah. Like all of Stoicism, it's very demanding. So technically, yeah. the Stoics would say that only the sage would actually be courageous, right? Because only the sage has every aspect of virtue. And as you mentioned before, they're so unified. They're just multiple faces of the same thing. So only the sage could reach that high of a bar. But I think, I think the rest of us can strive for it. And that's what I find so valuable about stoicism in general and ideas of courage in particular is that we may not become completely courageous. We may not have our minds completely in the right place, but we can get closer than we are right now. So that's progress. We're looking for progress. Absolutely. I think I can share one example where I stepped back from making an immediate decision about something that might help illustrate how all the virtues interplay. And I was by no means stoic consciously in that at that time, but somehow the spirit of Epictetus must have spoken to me. I don't know. I'll share this with you and let me know what you think. This is about 10 years ago and I was teaching in a college. It was a small college in North Sydney and I was in the English department and there was a small group of us. There were four teachers. We were really close and working well together. And then they brought in a new director of studies who was our immediate, our boss. And what happened then was transformative as soon as this new person walked into the office everything changed she would just micromanage us and did that whole divide and conquer type scenario so very quickly we were 
not connecting, not talking, fearful of what one person was saying about the other. It was this really just awful situation. And I wanted to drop everything and leave in typical dramatic Catherine fashion, which wouldn't have been courageous or wise, but it seemed to me at that point the most courageous thing was to stand up for myself, speak aloud how awful the situation was and how awful the new director of studies was, drop everything, make a scene and walk out. For some reason, I didn't do that. I persisted. I also sought counsel in my mum and a couple of other people. And I think with stoicism, one of the big things is that you can't always make the decision by yourself. You need to talk to people because you're in a community and seek role models, etc. So I decided that I would endure the situation. And it was really awful. It was just awful turning up to work every day. And everyone was equally feeling awful. So I endured that. I thought I was being weak and unable to make a decision and unable to stand for myself and unable to stand for everyone else and save everyone else. But now looking back, I thought it was something that I felt I could endure. Meanwhile, it wouldn't have been prudent for me to just drop everything and walk out. I didn't have another job to step into. I certainly wouldn't have been left on the streets. I had family in Australia. Someone would have taken care of me. So I didn't have to stay at work because I'd be destitute. But I think it was a more prudent choice to linger and endure the situation in order to find work that would be suitable, not just jump into any job. Was I being wise? I certainly spent a lot of time considering the choices that I was making or about to make. So rethinking that now from a stoic lens, I see that maybe there was, it was a better way to act than just dropping everything and walking out, which I probably would have done prior to that. And what happened in the end was that everyone, we also helped each other get through this, made amends with the director of studies. She did leave, but uh, there wasn't a big traumatic incident. I did find a really good job because I actually waited to look for a job that would be better. So in the end, it all worked out. So yeah, it doesn't look like any superheroic thing happened, but it all worked out. I don't know if that's an interesting way of living. It it does seem awful to have spent almost a year in that awful situation before I found a way to step away proudly and honorably. But I don't know. What do you think? Do you have a similar example? I love your example. I think that it is a great demonstration of that quiet and consistent courage that doesn't get the attention. Like you said, no one's going to make a Hollywood movie about it. But I think that is the kind of courage we're called on to display most frequently. Sometimes it is the right thing to do if there's something really egregious going on, or if you see someone who's powerless, sometimes it's definitely the right thing to do to stand up and defend them, defend yourself. Other times it isn't the right thing to do. And Mm -hmm. it just depends on the context. It sounds like in your case, you did find a positive resolution or as positive as could be expected from that situation. Mm. No one was seriously injured. No, Everyone left on relatively good terms. You went on a better job. So I think that you did display both wisdom and courage in that situation. And I think throughout history, or if you look at most people's everyday lives, this is the kind of wisdom and courage we're called on to do most often. The drop Mm -hmm. everything courage is only occasionally. And when you need it, you obviously need it. You've got to do it. You've got to rise to the occasion. But in, in everyday life, we're more often negotiators, right? Working to get Mm -hmm. along. So maybe justice and courage are tied together in that sense where we have to navigate a very complex social world. We have to judge other people's characters and try to think, do they know what they're doing? Is this a misunderstanding, a misinterpretation? Mm -hmm. Or it's just so complex. Sometimes we make the right decision. Sometimes we don't, but we always have to do our best. So I think that's a fantastic example. And I think also in reading this Cicero, the section on distress and how you can't be wise if you're distressed and you certainly can't be courageous. I think if I had left the job bang on when it was really awful, I was clearly in a state of distress, as were my colleagues. I don't know. I think leaving the job was ultimately the right choice, but also that's where prudence kicks in. What is the right, how, what is the right thing to do and when. Whereas I think we have a gut response and it's usually right in that situation to get up and leave because it's just awful. 
but it wouldn't have it it might have been the right choice but it wouldn't have been a courageous choice because it would have been a choice I would have made in a state of distress yeah which is really interesting I think I call these chamber pot questions not a very flattering name there's that passage in Epictetus where he says he's talking to one of his students and he says would you hold a chamber pot if you're a slave and your master forces you to hold his chamber pot while he's relieving himself are you going to do it or do you think it's beneath your dignity now if you say no what's in store for you brutal mm-hmm. beating probably maybe worse things were extremely awful back then uh, on the other hand are you just going to go along with it so you can be done with it and get your supper so that's a, a very extreme example but it's the same he says you have to know yourself if you know yourself whether you're willing to do that or not and again it's not going to be the same answer for two people with different life experiences different social connections maybe one of them is a father and he wants to be there for his child or something like that that's going to make a difference mm-hmm. so no one else can give you those answers so it's mm-hmm. really interesting that you're looking back and analyzing it from a stoic perspective now it's something i also i tell my daughter going back to your note from cicero about distress she obviously kids get frustrated really easily And so I always tell her when she's really frustrated about something, we need to calm down first because mm. your brain just shuts off when you're angry and upset. You can't think properly. So before we can make a decision and figure this out, we need to calm down first. So I mm. think you're right. I think sister is right. The Stoics are right. When you're under the sway of those passions, those mm. negative emotions, you're not going to make any kind of good judgment at all. Yeah. Yes, and I think that I think I might bring up the example of when I read this passage about distress I know I'm going on about it but I think it's just so important to have that calm mind as you said in order to be able to act there's the example of Portia that I've been thinking about a lot lately and it's still early thoughts about Portia Portia has been coming up in some of the online discussions about women stoics and Portia was married to Brutus who was plotting to assassinate Julius Caesar and the idea is that she wanted to be involved in the plot or at least to know about the plot and to be privy to certain secrets etc but she felt that Brutus wasn't telling her anything because she was a woman would be weak would maybe bend under pressure and reveal the secrets of the assassination plot so what she did was that she cut herself there's some wonderful paintings of Portia she cut herself in order to show that she could endure pain uh to show Brutus that she was would not reveal the secrets of the assassination plot And I'm bringing this up because Portia is one of the only women that come up in sites that um try to promote ancient women as stoics. She was certainly according to Plutarch, she really loved philosophy. She was wise. So she certainly had was certainly a philosophic character, but I I don't agree that her act of cutting herself in order to prove that she could endure pain is an act of courage because i imagine at the time being married to someone who's plotting to assassinate <laughs> Julius Caesar must have been a really stressful time right like she must and not only that she had lost her father previously so she must have been grieving so back to cicero portia must have been under incredible stress mental stress therefore my argument is that her seemingly courageous and bold act to withstand the pain of torture so cutting herself to show that she can withstand pain cannot be courage because she would have acted in that way under a lot of mental stress and i'm bringing that up because that seems to be the only woman that is quoted or celebrated as a strong she's actually called a stoic superwoman on one of the sites i think it's Ryan Holiday's daily stoic and so what we're talking about is something very different is i can't see in the porsche example any wisdom obviously a cicero would say no she's distressed she can't be wise or even prudence was cutting herself the best way 
to prove herself. Yeah. These are early thoughts on Portia, but I wonder, do you have a comment? Yeah. I am not a historian of ancient Rome, so it's hard for me to parse all of the contextual factors that would have been at play. You mentioned some of them, but I think part of, partly it just shows how awful conditions were for women back then. There were no good choices for her. It's like in a less extreme form, us having to choose between career and family. There are no good mm-hmm. choices. There's no perfect choice. I think that is an act of, it's one of those physical bravery acts that in the right circumstances certainly is brave. I don't know what was going through her mind. So it's hard to pass judgment when you don't actually know what her mindset was, what were her exact motivations. We can guess, obviously, but I would say we shouldn't necessarily pass judgment one way or another, and maybe focus on more relevant (laughs) role models. I think (laughs) I love Elizabeth Carter. I know you love Elizabeth Carter too, but I think Elizabeth Carter, so she was in the 18th century, she was actually the first person to translate Epictetus into English. For those of our listeners who aren't familiar with her, she was an amazing scholar, highly respected. She actually came from a very very scholarly family, but she showed lots of endurance and hard work in her childhood by teaching herself. I think her father tried to teach her Latin and Greek, and she was a hopeless learner for some reason. He gave up on her ever learning. And then she set herself to learn those two languages. And she ended up throughout her lifetime learning about five others as well, Portuguese and Arabic, I think among them. And she determined early on that she was not going to marry. So she was really stepping outside Mm -hmm. the social confines of her world At that time, women were definitely expected to marry and start a household. And she determined to devote herself to her studies for her entire life. And that's what she did. She refused offers of marriage. She was able to hang around with elite, the literary luminaries of the day, like Samuel Johnson, who created the English Dictionary and many others as well. And she was very erudite. So she translated Epictetus and ended up earning her own own way in the world. She made enough money to become financially independent. She was offered patronage by people who thought she was a great scholar. So to me, she's the more inspiring example of stoic courage outside of our contemporary context, obviously a lot closer to us than Portia, but just a very strong and I think virtuous in her way. woman. Which reminds me that you're really interested in exploring, you'll be talking about that at the conference, about role models and how important seeking role models is so I know Elizabeth Carter is a prime example for you and for all of us I think should be is there anything you want to bring up from the Stoics about the importance of role models and why we seek them and should seek them and how do we choose them how do we know it's almost as if you don't know enough about Stoicism you can't choose the right Stoic (laughs) role model maybe role models are so important because they inspire us and guide us in their way when you're in a situation that calls for courage how do you know what to do you can think of what your courageous role model would do in that situation choosing a role model can be difficult if you don't know the definition of virtue so you'd probably want to do a little bit of homework (laughs) beforehand but it's definitely something we should all do. We should actually take time to sit down and identify who our role models are, because when you need it in that situation, you really need it. You don't have time to do your research at that point. So I would advise if you are looking for a role model, just in general, not specifically for courage, but in general, that you look at that person's overall actions. It could be somebody in your own life, maybe a teacher when you were younger, or a family member or a mentor in some way could be a historical figure. That's always a great option, although a little riskier because like we were saying with Portia, it's hard to judge when you don't know everything that was going on back then. It's hard to contextualize, but we can still draw inspiration from them. But I would say, look at how that person treated the people around them. I think sometimes it's easy to get caught up in the glamour and the showiness, but what really matters for a role model is how they are in their everyday life. Not just that one courageous moment, but over the long term. When you're looking for a courageous role model, don't forget that the rest of the person's life has to be admirable as well. It's not just that one thing. Yeah. So that would be my advice. That's really interesting because, yeah, as we mentioned earlier, all the four virtues play a role in whether 
someone is courageous, for example, we need to consider whether their choice was wise and self-controlled control, and just. I think that's really interesting. And, of course, Seneca, we've got his quote here, that we must learn what to do from someone who is already doing it. It is hard to know who, though, if we don't know enough about Stoicism. So it's just, yeah, study, observation, seeking role models, study, observation, seeking role models. I think we're almost done, but one just one thing that really interests me about courage is we often feel that the courageous choice is entails risk of some sort. But there's a bit in Seneca, and it's Seneca Letters 85.26, and uh, he actually addresses this. Someone is suggesting that the courageous person will take risks, will put themselves in harm's way. And Seneca says that, no, actually, that he won't. He will avoid danger if he can. If you've got a choice, basically, you're not going to choose the risky option. You're going to step back from that. You're going to exercise caution, but not because you're afraid of the risk or that the act might be dangerous to you, but just that, yeah, a, a wise, courageous person is not going to choose a fight. I think that goes back again to the internal state, whether you're choosing not to take that risk because of fear, which would not be courageous, or because of prudence, which would be courageous. Yeah. So again, it's the matter of the agent's internal state at the time the choice is made. Yeah. And it's tricky. It's tricky for ourselves. It's tricky for w- when we observe other people. And no one ever said that virtue is easy, right? <laughs> it's hard. It's really hard. It takes a lot of practice. It takes lifelong work, but yeah. it's worth it in the end because we know it leads to that path of flourishing and tranquility and meaning. And that's why we're here. That's what we want in our lives. And courage is a part of it along with all the other virtues. I have this image of before I make a decision from now on, I'm going to call like a round table meeting and just invite wisdom, courage, prudence, justice, gather around, let's discuss. And actually I just thought that's a great journaling exercise as I'm really into journaling with Stoics. It'd be really interesting to, before you make a decision, to get each of the virtues, to personify them and they can each write like a letter to you about what they think you should do. Brittany, thank you for this conversation. I think we've just started the conversation, right? There's so much more. I think we brought in a couple of personal examples that illustrated things to think about with courage. They're not perfect examples, obviously, because none of us are sages, as you said. We're all works in progress. I think there are like only two sages ever. Was it Thich Nhat Hanh, the Dalai Lama maybe, and maybe <laughs> Epictetus three? Like we're never going to get there. And I'm quite happy being a work in progress because I get to have conversations like this with you. Um, so final word, not quite final word on courage because we've got an entire conference to look forward to, but final word for this podcast? Don't give up. Just give yourself credit. Look at what you've done in the past and what the seeds of courage are. We've all done some things in the past that are courageous, like you were sharing and look at what you've done before and see how you can grow those aspects of yourself and really give yourself credit, really work on those particular seeds, water them, nurture them. It's your garden and Not to be too poetic here, but in the end, you'll have a beautiful harvest. (laughs) Oh, I love that. That's a great way to end. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning into the Stoic Psalm podcast. Thanks, Brittany, for a great conversation, really thought-provoking, and we'll continue. If you're listening to this before October 2022, pop on over to our conference website, Paths to flourishing.org just register so you can get some updates on our conference in october if you're listening to this after october then pop on over anyway because you'll see what happened and you can catch up with us then 